If I say wasp, what's your first thought? Yikes. Ouch. Sting. Bad. Kill them. What if I were to tell you that wasps are really great and for your garden for several reasons. One is they are a pollinator. Many wasps also pollinate flowers for us. We are talking about pollinators this week and today I wanted to tell you a little bit about wasps. Hi, I'm Amy Landers with Gardens That Matter where we help families create beautiful, bountiful gardens together. And my family right now is inside getting ready for bed, getting on their pajamas, reading the book with dad. And I wanted to sneak out here and do a quick live because um, I didn't get to do one earlier today in the middle of the day. Like I, I usually try to get, get this out um, in the middle of the day, come on with you guys. I didn't get to because we had graduation from preschool for my oldest. Oh, growing up so fast, but it was fun. Lots of great singing and um, celebration, great picnic at the park. We had a really good time. And so then we came home and we took naps and we've been playing all afternoon and I just, just now getting back out here. And I wanted to talk to you guys about some wasp pollinators. So if you've um, followed along this week or if you go back and check um, our playlist, we've been talking about pollinators. Um, next week is gonna be pollinator week as well. And we're gonna um, finish up with a big free online workshop where you can, kind of a webinar or a master class, where you can put together a menu for your own pollinator garden um, with plants that are gonna work for your space with all the different things that pollinators are gonna need. That's gonna be on Friday, June 9th at 9 p.m. and there's a link for it in the description. Now, at the top, I asked what wasps make you think. Maybe put it in the comments, tell me what you think. When you hear the word wasp, is, your, is, your, is it fear, right? Let's look at a picture of one, right? So, look at that guy. Ooh, yikes. I do, I have the same thing, right? Maybe you've been stung by yellow jackets before. Maybe you've been stung by a wasp before. They usually can sting more than once, um, unlike a honeybee. But really, any kind of sting like that really does hurt. And so, you know, we wanna protect ourselves, we wanna protect our kids, so our initial thought is, oh, kill them, right? Get them out of the garden. The, but, I want to ask you to withhold judgment for a little bit and think about wasps um, in a new way. So let's see, what have I got for you? Um, we have some of this beautiful paper that they make, chew up wood fibers. So some wasps will make paper nests. Inside they'll have this kind of pattern. So this is from probably a paper, paper wasp nest. Um, yellow jackets will make a similar kind of comb underground usually. They'll be in a, in a hole somewhere. Um, but most wasps are not going to be a colony like this. Most wasps are going to be more solitary. So they might make a hole, make holes in the ground. They might make the little mud dauber. They look like little flutes on the side of a building. Um, and so there's, they're solitary. They don't have a nest to defend. And so generally they're not going to sting you unless you accidentally step on one or smush one or try to catch one, right? Um, usually they're going to just go about doing their thing. So what is their thing, right? Well, adult wasps drink nectar and eat pollen. And so on this plant behind me, this is mountain mint, and it hasn't started to bloom yet. Oh, I have one here that I can show you up close. And I'm gonna tell you about it a little bit in a few, just a few minutes. I'm gonna tell you more about this plant, and it hasn't started to bloom yet, but last year, when it was blooming, it was covered with insects. And I was just looking through the pictures earlier, um, and I found five different wasps that I took pictures of it with. So there's this one, which I think is a mason wasp. It's a black and white one. So the other black and white um, wasp-like insect we have here is uh, the bald-faced hornet, but I'm pretty sure this one is, is, the, is the wasp, is the mason wasp. Then we've got this one that has iridescent blue wings. It is gorgeous and big. Can you see how big? So like, there's that flower head same flower, same size flower head there. Like that is a big wasp. And so that one is maybe a mud dauber or a blue mud wasp. So I still have to do more. I gotta learn more, just like my bumblebees. I need to learn all my bumblebees and I need to learn all my wasps. Um, there's this one down here, 
which I think is a maybe a paper wasp. It's those red and black wings are kind of like cicada killers as well. It's another name for one of the wasps. And then this picture actually has two. And so this lower one is maybe a waste mason wasp, or there's also like a golden digger that has that coloration pattern. And this top one, see it? So they're both pretty big. It's probably a mud dauber. So these are all five on the same flower. This is July of last year. So July 2016, all four of these wasps were on the same flower, which is this mountain mint behind me, uh, which isn't in bloom yet, but it will be soon. So what were they doing? They were getting nectar and pollen to eat for their own energy because they are making babies and then making nests. So if they're social, they're building that the wasp nest, you know, the paper nest, they might be building in a hollow tree, they might be building hanging from a tree or a building. If they're solitary, they may be digging those potter wasps. And the mason wasps tend to gather up mud and make little mud, um, little mud, almost like a little vase that can hang from a tree or a edge of a house, maybe the mud dubbers with their little flutes. So they are got to have energy to build those nests and to mate, and then they're going to lay eggs, and then they need to feed their larva. So the eggs hatch, insect life cycle, right? The eggs hatch, then we've got little larva, little white, usually kind of whitish, clearish larva. And what do they eat? They eat chewed up caterpillars. So here is another reason that wasps are actually good to have in your garden. Um, they feed their young. They go out and collect caterpillar and other soft-bodied insects, so aphids and whiteflies, other small larvae, um, and they bring them back and they chew them up to feed their larvae. So really good um, pest control. They're beneficial insects to have in your garden. These large wasps um, are, are great to have in your garden. Now, if you have a yellow jacket nest in your yard, you probably are going to need to do something about that. Either rope it off, because they probably won't nest there again the next year, um, so you could rope it off and keep everybody away from it, or you may want to exterminate that nest. But in general, these wasps, when you see them, you can like take that moment of like, oh no, wasp, I gotta do something, and take a deep breath and remember all the great things that they do for you. Um, and then if a wasp does get on you or is around you, the best thing to do is not to swat it, not to try to like hit it away from you. It's just to brush it off of you and then walk away from it. Uh, maybe walk quickly because it's hard not to, right? And then the other tip that I have for you is when you are drinking a drink outside that's a sweet drink, especially towards the end of the summer, those yellow jackets will try to get in there. And so you want to get that drink and put it in a clear glass and don't drink it out of a straw because that's happened to Colby. He drank a yellow jacket and it stung his tongue. And it was a mess. It was a mess. This is before I knew him, but it's like a story that he tells. It, it was very memorable, right? Don't drink out of a straw. Put it in a clear glass or a plastic clear glass so that you can see if there's a yellow jacket in your drink. So now let's talk about this plant. Um, oh, do you know what I should tell you a little bit more about wasps real quick? Because I didn't finish that life cycle. We talked about how to avoid them. So after the larvae grow up, they will basically spin a little pupa, a little cocoon. Um, different different ones do it in different ways, and then they will emerge. Um, and then they, the reproductive ones. So if it's a social one, they will sometimes be worker, workers, just like in a bee colony. Um, if they're in, if they're they're solitary, they'll be reproductive, so they'll either have another generation, another life cycle if this season's long enough, or those reproductive females will mate and then winter away in a hollow log under some bark, hidden away, and then come the next year and be pollinating your garden and eating those garden pests again. So, good stuff, good stuff. Um, there's a whole group of plants that depend upon wasps as their pollinators. Um, sorry, I I know I'm jumping around a little bit. I, I flipped over my notepad and I'm like, oh, I totally didn't talk about figs. So another broadcast, we will talk about figs and the fig wasp because it is amazing. Not today, but um, basically the figs wouldn't exist without the wasps and the wasps wouldn't exist without the figs. They have a mutualistic um, relationship and it's, and it's amazing, right? Uh, so if you love figs, you might want to Google it because it's fascinating and a little gross. 
but also fascinating. There's also orchids that are reliant on wasps and um, researchers use like little tiny, tiny, tiny dots um, that they put on the back of these wasps to do studies. I was, I was watching about that the other day. <laughs> really interesting stuff. All right, now let's talk about this mountain mint. Um, there's so much we could talk about about any of these insect pollinators or vertebrate pollinators. Um, so I'm just trying to hit the highlights so that you get this introduction and then you are have maybe a new idea about things. Um, let's see, I, a, a ladybug. It's later in the evening, so there's not a lot of action on the plants themselves. There's some flea bane. I don't know if that's in this shot. There's flea bane here, and that's rue, the yellow. Uh, there's some yarrow in the background. So there is some, some good food out here, but not too active. So let's talk about this mountain mint. Um, so like I said, it's not blooming yet. It'll bloom. This is a summertime bloomer, so it'll bloom later later in June or definitely in July. It'll just be full of these nice big blooms. Lots of their composite flowers, so lots of different little flowers um, and continuous nectar and pollen throughout the summer season. So really great for that. So it is not a true mint. So the true mints are the mintha, mintha genus, M-E-N-T-H-A, right? Uh, mintha is true mint. These are a native North American mountain mint, not only found in the mountains um, and not a true mint, but they're in the mint family. So mints belong to the Lamaceae family. Um, so also in that family are things like basil and the lamb's ear we talked about yesterday. Um, the bee balm is also in that. Monarda is also in that same Lamaceae family. So it's a great great group to grow in your garden alongside your fruits and vegetables. So this one, um, Pycnanthemum, pic, um, is a genus that is native to North America. They grow pretty much anywhere um, different species do. Uh, there's several dozen species, sorry there's some gnats, like even my mountain mint's not keeping them away. Uh, there's several dozen species. Um, and they're also a great plant if you have some challenges in your garden, like deer or rabbits, uh, drought. This plant tends to be pretty drought resistant. Once it gets established, it to deer don't really eat it, rabbits don't really eat it. So good pollinator action, good for challenging spaces in your garden, or challenges in your garden. And then um, it's also kind of a pest repellent or can be. Some varieties are really pungent like the short toothed mountain mint is very pungent. This one is not as pungent as that although it still has this really great kind of spicy minty smell. Um, it's definitely one of our favorite plants. Um, so if you don't have mountain mint in your garden I recommend that you find some and get it planted. The best time to plant perennials like this if you're going to plant from, um, from, from started plants it would be fall. But if you want to plant it now, you can. You just will need to give it a little extra attention. Whenever you plant a plant in the middle, in like early summer, especially if you plant in the middle of summer, it's just going to need a little extra attention. It might need um, some shade right when you first put it in, just so that it gets established. It'll definitely need some supplemental water um, that first season. Uh, you'll want to just baby it a little bit that first season, but then it'll just be a nice tough plant and it spreads by runners. So this patch goes from here to here, all the way over here, and it's probably, I don't know, it's probably four or five feet. Can you, I don't know if you can see, there's a gap back there with, there's a different color plant back there, that's rosemary. Uh, so it's pretty far back. There's a path there too, but it's about four feet back. So it spreads. This was one plant when I put it in. Um, but it's easy to pull out. It's easy to move to another spot in the garden um, if you want to, to move the abundance of mountain mint. This variety has fairly big leaves, but there are some that have beautiful thin leaves. That's what I'm adding to my garden this fall is some of the thin leafed variety. Some of it's really hairy and silvery. Some of it's darker colored. So there is a, a variety of mountain mint to fit any taste um, and any aesthetic. So wasps plus mountain mint, a winning combination in our garden. And I think that you would enjoy it as well. And when you see those wasps, take a deeper breath and remember, they're great pollinators and great pest control.
All right, we will be back next week. We're going to talk honeybees. We're going to talk yucca moths, um, another native bee that I want to tell you about. We're going to talk hummingbirds. We'll have five different pollinators and their plants next week. And then on Friday, we'll cap it off with that workshop. So if you would love to grow a pollinator paradise, of your own um, or make your yard even more of a pollinator paradise my guess is you already grow some pollinator plants um, and so if you want to do more of that join me for that workshop it's gonna be a free online workshop at 9 p.m. Eastern on June 9th I would love to see you then thanks so much for watching and until I see you again happy gardening